I've got 20 or 30 slides lined up here, but you know, we've got a small group here, and I don't want to. It's you know, two days into the workshop. I don't want to bore you with stuff that you don't want to hear. So I figure we start a little bit about what you're interested in hearing and, and sort of who we've got in the group, and then I'll adjust and maybe even skip off the slides if people are interested, and we can actually look at some of the tools that are on our website if people are interested in that more than um, what I have prepared. So let me first get a sense for how many people here are sort of grad student postdoc researchers? Okay, we've got one. And then um, PIs? Right. And, and then I, we've got um, editor publisher um, from Eli's here in the room, <laughs> and some other people who uh, um, went to software um, research, software engineers, and 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 uh, and what what have I missed in terms of career? Uh, I'm PhD. <laughs> PhD. Okay. Okay. So um, the slides that I have prepared go a bit through the data sharing policies that are at the Nature Journals, which is useful if you ever intend to submit to one of them. And then give a bit of basic advice on how people can share data. Again, being very, very basic, because usually I'm talking with non-computational researchers and trying to get them to share their data in a way where computationalists can actually use it. And then a bit of advice on data repositories, how to select a data repository, and what we think you should look for when you're going for a data repository. If, if people think that's interesting, I'll plow through the slides. Um, and you know, if I see that you're falling asleep or something, we can break out. But feel free to, to interrupt me as we go, because again, this is aimed very much at young researchers. So um, you know, we'll see how how relevant it is. But so let's a quick introduction to the nature research data sharing policies. Just you know, this is useful background if you're submitting to any of our journals. Um, and the policies have changed markedly over the last five to ten years. And before I get to the nature policies, um, I'd like to actually go back about um, 800 years. So we have this unfortunate view that data sharing is a new idea, um, but the idea that you have to show your evidence is about as old as the conception of science. So this is a quote from Roger Bacon, not Francis Bacon. Roger Bacon was actually you know, early medieval, in the 13th century. So he wrote, Theory supplied by reason should be verified by sensory data, aided by instruments, and corroborated by trustworthy witnesses. And he also wrote, the strongest argument proves nothing so long as the conclusions are not verified by experience. So what he's talking about here is I'm not going to believe your science unless I can see the underlying measurements, data. Now at that time, that might mean you go to the, the researchers um, lab, or in this case it would be probably a monastery, and you watch him do the experiment. And maybe 100 years ago this might have meant, well, I want to see your numbers in a table in the publication. But we're doing huge data generating, um, and digital science these days. And so I would say pretty much if you need to, scientists need to figure out how to show that evidence to other researchers. We shouldn't talk so much about well, Code, code equally, but yeah. No, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, but like, if you look at uh, Galileo and Kepler, isn't that kind of the opposite? So yeah, you don't have to remind me of the story there. Oh, just, so the, just the data wasn't shared at all, and yeah. the conclusions was the important part. Right? And if somebody else wanted to verify data, they might build their own data in order to test it or not test it. So you Galileo was very protective of his data. I think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there are certainly counterexamples. Um, I mean, I think. Uh, Sorry, I'm just. I'm just yeah. gonna, I think I'm just kind of arguing a little bit about there has always been a key part of science. Well, so I, I you know, I, yeah, and I, I think there are counterexamples there, and I think that there are places where theories have to be used as quickly as they can. I mean, certainly Darwin was extremely open with his data. For example, certainly the modern synthesis is based on a bunch of genetic data. Um, certainly, some of the early um, gas bomb. You know, that was very much propagated by the idea of not only are you going to record the experiment, but again, you invite people into the lab to see the experiment run. Um, the Royal Society's motto basically translates um, to take the one's word for it. So even if we've never lived up to this idea, this idea it's an idea, it's not a new idea, I guess I would say. 
So, but no, it's a valid point. It's a valid point. It, but I, I guess the point is there's probably workshops like this 300 years ago. They're just more talking about digital data. They're talking about you know, how are we gonna, yeah. Um, and so if anyone says, oh, I don't want to be sharing my data, well, you, uh, you, yeah, you should question whether they're doing science, basically. Um, so it's been a fundamental policy of the nature journals and the nature for, for decades now that it's an inherent principle of publication that others should be able to replicate and build upon the author's published claims. So at minimum, um, authors are required to make material data code and the associated protocols promptly available um, to readers basically upon request. And we all know that upon request sharing is not great. But so th basically, so this is the baseline policy. This has been in place for a long time. If you read something interesting in our journals, you have the right to send an email to that author and say, I would like the data. And if they don't give it to you, the editors will want to know. So a lot of people don't, I, I think, really realize that they have that right. And you have this right as a reviewer as well. And so exercise that, that's part of scientific understanding. Um, but we know that sharing upon request can be unreliable. A lot of data disappears. There's good studies that show, at least in biological sciences, about every year, about 17% of it disappears as you go back in the literature. So once you're five years back, the chances that that email works and the postdoc is still there and they know where the file is starts to get really, really small, unfortunately. So that's a, there's a good um, publication actually looking at that decay uh, down there. You might want to copy down. I can give you the DOI later. Combines it all. And of course, it's hard to reference this data if it's shared upon request. And it's just a bad mechanism. So the nature sharing, uh, the nature research group, we've updated our policies over the last about five years progressively. So we now express a clear preference for sharing of large data sets via public repositories, which I think most people will agree on. We enforce data deposition in communities that have gotten their act together and have a real um, mandate that you must share. These are things like genome sequences. You have to share it, and you have to share it in a specific way. Um, and, we, and we enforce those. Um, we have a list of public data repositories, and that's maintained by my journal, Scientific Data. Um, and we encourage authors to publish data descriptors at Scientific Data, so I'll give you a little bit more information about that. Um, and there's now a requirement for data availability statements in almost all of our publications, certainly all of our primary research publications. And code availability statements are actually um, required first. So that we've had code availability statements for about a year and a half, and, and data availability statements for now a little bit less than a year in the vast majority of our publications. Okay, so those, that's policy. Does anyone have questions on that sort of policy aspect before I get into the like useful tips and um, opinion? Okay. So I'm going to give some basic tips on how to share your data in a useful manner. Um, and I'm going to open this up and tr try to make it a bit interactive. And I want to keep in mind that oftentimes I'm telling biologists like the simplest things that they can do in order to make their data accessible to people who want to do real analysis. But in the same way you could look at this, and I think um, computationalists and programmers tend to get make things too complicated. So if you just have an interesting data set and you want biologists to be able to understand it, what can you do? And, and so basically I'm saying you know, creating a complicated Sparkle query or a fancy GUI is not always the answer. So it shouldn't always be the first step. Um, one of the sort of goals that we encourage people to keep in mind, it's a nice um, sort of rule of thumb, when you're trying to share your data, think about making it fair. So, and this is just a useful acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this is, I think, a slightly more useful framework than just making it open. Open is awesome, but open has some very specific concepts about licensing. And there's, you can have data sets that are very fair, but may not be fully open. And, and so there's a balance there. And so, yeah, um, there's publication. Uh, these were principles were developed by a Force 11 group um, and are supported by a number of different uh, data uh, related associations now. So the first thing you can do with your data is publish it as supplemental material, which for small data sets is not the worst thing in the world. It's a pretty easy way to get it out if you're publishing with journals. 
it's pretty stable over time. You know, Nature publications, we haven't lost any supplemental material in the you know, several decades that we've been doing online publication. Um, it's, you can share a lot of things that way. It works for small code. It's not great, though, because it's poorly curated. Journals often, nature journals won't do this, but some journals will try to convert everything into PDF, which is bad. Um, it's usually not machine readable, and it, it's a poor credit mechanism. But even within supplementary material, you know, if you're sharing your data as supplementary material, think about making it useful. So I want to do a little bit of an exercise here, a simple data table. And I, I want to say, you know, looking at this data table, um, what could you recommend to make it better? Or if you're trying to ingest this into MATLAB, what's going to piss you off? So merge cells. Yeah, merge cells. Colors. Yeah, so merge cells and colors, okay. That, that's, those are a pain, right? Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, which, which is, could be significant or could be, well, you know, this day we think that the ozone contamination in the lab is too high or something. Um, yeah, yeah, we don't know what the groups are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that might depend a bit yeah, on the spreadsheeting, but yeah. Yeah. No, those are all really good points. So here's, here's what, I, what we had. So yeah, definitely the colors um, are a problem. Um, we've got some undefined abbreviations here in the chemical column. Um, yeah, we've got meaningless column names. We've got no units. And if you have units, obviously, the better thing to do is something in a separate column or in a separate encoding. Um, and if anyone, um, so it's an unhelpful document name, but if anyone has actually CUO is sort of an ancient Amiga spreadsheet format. So um, no one's going to be able to open it in the first place. So. Um, so yeah, so this is something better, right? I mean, and, and I, hopefully most computationalists would agree. We've got, um, we've broken your days up into a separate column. We've got control and treated. Obviously, you know, treated could be even more specific depending on the experiment. We've got units in a separate column. We've got p-values instead of stars. It's now in XLS, which is okay, maybe CSV or XLS S, SO. SX, it would be slightly better. CSV tends to be the best long-term way of sharing data, but a lot of biologists do like to have things that open cleanly in Excel. So, um, yeah. So simple things, right? Share, if you've got small data sets, this is going to be what most researchers are going to need. And if you can share this as supplemental material, you're doing all right. But if you can get this into a data repository, you're doing even better. So that's kind of the next step. Um, and of course, before I go any further, so, you know, making a good table is nice, but you should know your sta the standards in your community. And I think this is particularly relevant as well for um, um, computer scientists and others that might dabble in different natural science fields, learning about the standards that that particular experimental field actually uses to share their data, super, super important. So in biology, you can browse standards here. In the earth sciences, there are a number of different standards around that CDF. In the clinical sciences, there's a lot of different specific data formatting standards. They may seem arcane and painful, but usually those, those communities went through a very difficult process to learn those formats. So make sure you at least understand what those standards are before you develop a new one <laughs> and throw it into the community. 